uh, from history that can apply to our current racial situation. So the first point I want to make is simply the power of whiteness in American history. More often than not, I hear people talking about uh, America's racial problem in terms of blackness or other colors. And people who are white don't stop and think that they somehow have race. So I want to illustrate the power of whiteness as it played out in American history. In the 19th century, uh, whiteness dominated the social, political, and economic life of this country. Politicians equated being white with citizenship and with fitness for self-rule. Whiteness was taken for granted. It was deemed normal or natural. And anything that wasn't white was seen as unnatural or not normal and incapable of participating in a democracy. The very first Congress of the United States, 1790, established conditions for becoming a naturalized citizen. And the qualifications? You had to be free and you had to be white. In 1848, on the floor of the United States Senate, Senator John C. Calhoun said, democracy is the government of a white race. His argument was, we've looked around the globe. There are no non-white groups who are practicing democracy. Therefore, they are incapable of self-determination and self-rule. We need to understand the power that whiteness has played across the course of American history, in other words. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, in its Dred Scott decision in 1857, expressed a similar sentiment when it declared that blacks possessed no rights, no rights, that the white man was bound to respect. Abraham Lincoln, even the great future emancipator, announced in 1858 that he was not in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. As he sought, as long as blacks and whites coexisted, there must be the position of superior and inferior, and in such a situation, he favored the superior position assigned to the white race. Following the Civil War, remember we fought a war uh, to deal with slavery and then the racial issue, and there were three constitutional amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the 13th Amendment outlaws slavery, the 14th Amendment grants civil rights, 15th Amendment grants black suffrage. But after federal troops were withdrawn from the South in 1877, you just simply have the reassertion of white supremacy by Southern whites through Jim Crow laws and segregation efforts. And remember, the Supreme Court of the United States puts its stamp of approval in 1896 on legal segregation, that separate but equal was legal. And so obviously it's going to take until the 1950s and 60s for the civil rights movement to reclaim those rights that had been granted to African Americans by the 14th and 15th Amendments. So the first thing white people need to step back and understand the power that whiteness has played in American history. The second point I want to make is just simply the way in which race has been used historically to justify discriminatory policies and not just against black people, okay? So let me just kind of contextualize this. Um, I've grown increasingly discouraged over the past few years of, as I've watched racial violence after racial violence after racial violence. And one response from the black community has been to organize the Black Lives Matter movement. The black lash from largely white, uh, the white American community is to assert that all lives matter. This is not really helpful in terms of a response to the Black Lives Matter movement. It demonstrates an inability for some of us Americans to attempt to stand in anyone else's shoes. So I'd like to use some historical evidence that is designed to help us take a, take a step back from the All Lives Matter movement and personalize and look at this racial violence perhaps from a different lens. So the lens I'm going to use is from my own family history. And I'm going to take us back to 1838 to the state of Missouri. And my ancestors, Levi and Felinda Newton Merrick, had just arrived at a small outpost in Missouri called Hans Mill. On the 30th of October, a group of Missouri state militiamen rode into Hans Mill. These are official state militiamen who are supposed to 
protect and to serve. And they rode into this outpost in 1838, and a white male Mormon raised his hands and took his hat off and gave the signal for peace and quarter. And he was met with gunshots and shot down. One eyewitness also described what happened to another Mormon man, Thomas McBride. He surrendered his gun and gave up as a prisoner and was shot after his gun was surrendered. He was wounded and attempted to stand again, and when he attempted to rise again, he was hacked to death with a corn cutter. My ancestors, Levi Merrick and Charles Merrick, his 10-year-old son, ran into the blacksmith shop. Not a great place to try to hide. There were gaping holes between the slats that formed the walls of the blacksmith shop, and the Missouri militia simply poked their guns through the holes and fired at point-blank range. Levi Merrick was killed instantly. His 10-year-old son, Charles, was hiding behind the bellows in the blacksmith shop with two other young boys. And the militiamen came in, blew one of the young boys' heads off, shot Charles Merrick, wounded him mortally. He died four weeks later. And then the six-year-old boy was also wounded in the hip, but managed to survive. The Missouri State Militia, as a justification for this violence, used a racial justification. Nits make lice, and had they lived, they would have become a Mormon. You understand that nits make lice was a phrase in every other instance I've ever found it in the 19th century, used to justify extermination orders against Native Americans. How do you justify a legal extermination order against people who look like you in the state of Missouri in 1838? You suggest that somehow they are not like you. You racialize them as different from you, you denigrate them, and you dehumanize them. And we have then Mormons on the ground recognizing this dehumanization that was taking place. Parley P. Pratt, one Mormon leader, wrote about the way the Mormons were treated. He said they were treated as if we were, quote, some savage tribe or some colored race of foreigners. Mormons in Missouri were described as not worthy of voting, just like the black population. The white Mormons who were arriving in the state were denigrated as worse in condition than the black population in the state. There were conflations, and this is the way that you justify discriminatory policies, is you use racial rhetoric to do so. Another Mormon leader, Heber C. Kimball, acknowledged that the saints were not, quote, considered suitable to live amongst the white folk. No one was brought to justice for the Missouri expulsion, at least a part of the justification was that the Missouri majority mattered more than the lives of the white Mormon minority. Mormons who were unarmed and whose hands were in the air were shot down in Missouri. Following their expulsion, their leader, Joseph Smith, asked them to write petitions describing the loss of life and property from their expulsion from Missouri, and over 800 Mormons did so. They were collected and published by the Religious Studies Center at BYU. It's called the Missouri Redress Petitions. My ancestor Flinda's petition is in this collection. And when I read this collection today, I hear these 800 iterations of Mormon lives matter. And how helpful would it be to say, well, all Missouri lives mattered in 1838? Not very helpful. Not very helpful. So you understand then the Black Lives Matter movement simply means that black lives also matter. Black people feel like there's an extermination order against them. And the response from the white community that all lives matter, not very helpful. It doesn't acknowledge the racial violence that's taking place. So I'm only asking that we acknowledge the power of whiteness in American history, number one. Number two, the way in which race has been used to justify discriminatory policies, and if you can racialize a group of white Mormons, you can racialize anyone and use that as a justification for violence and discriminatory policies against them. Thank you.
Because we're all we've all like now, and but we're using we take it as an insult as opposed to being just proud of the fact that we have it. Yeah, you're welcome. And I think you know if we step back, try to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, and use whatever kind of tactic familiar to us in this particular situation, white more than less, right? If white Mormons can step back and say, wow, you know, this happened. It can happen to me. It can happen to anyone, right? Put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to start my remarks with uh, some personal experiences, and then I will go on to the research that I've done and hopefully end on a positive note, okay? Growing up on Chicago's South Side in the 1980s, I was unaware of my exceptional experience of racial integration. Half the students at my elementary school were black, one-third were white, and the remainder were Latino and Asian American. In my church congregation, leaders serving with my parents included a great-granddaughter of black slaves, a native Spaniard, a black World War II veteran, an immigrant from Hong Kong, a black descendant of Thomas Jefferson, and a woman who had become deputy director of the state health department, who we all know who that is, Kathy Stokes, right? All right. At many ward Christmas parties, Santa Claus was black. I sang the words to lift every voice and sing, and I know that better than the national anthem, by the way, <laughs> at school assemblies and learned the gospel from blacks and whites that were both involved in the civil <coughs> rights movement. I was aware of race, but I still didn't know the problem we all, we all live with. Excuse me. As I grew, old, grew older, uh, the outlines of this problem grew increasingly clear. One summer, my dad drove me beyond the city limits to visit a place like I had never lived before. The houses were different, very few people were walking, and every face was white. As we exited, my dad announced, these are the suburbs. Immediately fascinated, I exclaimed, I was about the age of my oldest daughter, so I can really picture this now, Dad, I know these. I studied them in school. In my high school, four and five students were black, and this was integrated compared to the other high schools on the south side. And here's my visual aid for the day, so I'll pass that around. <coughs> At several track meets our team attended, I was the only white person around, maybe for miles. As a member of my ward or church congregation, we would visit those in socially and racially isolated all-black housing projects long since demolished. After growing up for 15 years in integrated housing, schools and church congregations, our family moved to an affluent suburb of Minnesota, which might as well have been a whole other country or a whole other planet. After two years spent there and in college and in graduate school settings of great advantage that overlapped with whiteness, and time also in Harlem, New York, and a Spanish branch in New Jersey, the problem came into focus for me. So what is the problem we all live with? Recently, my students in my introductory sociology class studied this question by listening to an award-winning podcast on the black-white achievement gap in schools, Writ uh, produced by no other than a person that had grown up in integrated schools like myself, Nicole Hannah-Jones. This is the This American Life podcast. My students reached the same consensus as my experience in research. The problem we all live with is racial segregation. A student who grew up in a mostly white suburb of another segregated city, St. Louis, wept with godly sorrow that our society had not truly confronted the problem we all live with. A few students of color, I have a couple from the Bronx in my class, were kind of being segregated themselves in some of our nation's largest cities. Yet in most of their essays, and this is why we're here today, not because we need this, but we need to go out and take this as agents of change, most students admitted little prior awareness of how racial segregation profoundly shapes life chances on the basis of race. And many of them thought that the things they heard in that podcast <coughs> were from 1965, not from 2015. However, all students agree that if we do nothing today, segregation will still be the problem that we all live with. In my own research, uh, in my own published research and in countless other studies, racial segregation lies at the source of racial inequality in home ownership, access to credit, neighborhood quality, health, life expectancy, the perpetuation of prejudice, and racial inequality in wealth and in opportunity and in moving up in our society. 
For example, today the typical white family owns 13 times the wealth of the typical black family, which is mainly the product of racist housing policies in the past. So in my own work, I've looked at racial segregation in the foreclosure crisis, finding that neighborhoods that were segregated in the past were made targets of the subprime lending that, of course, spread uh, you know, into Arizona and South Florida, and everybody got hit by that, but that accumulated in inner cities for over a decade. Uh, and places like Prince George's County, right, are at the epicenter of the foreclosure crisis. Um, and other work that I've done, I looked at the Latino community. Um, most Latinos are native-born Americans, right? That's a memo for some people. Two-thirds of Latinos were born in the United States. But yet they still have to prove, like Dr. Reeve talked about, <coughs> that they belong in American society. A lot of Latinos want to celebrate. In the Spanish branch, they'd all have their, their soccer rivalries, they have their different dishes, and then they go out into society and perhaps be profiled by others for their race when they really just want to celebrate their ethnicity. Um, in the 1960s, tragically, when we made a lot of civil rights triumphs, we imposed quotas on immigration from the Western Hemisphere. And guess what? If you treat all countries equally, that's part of the problem because we have a long-term relationship with Mexico and the United States and we started to create a system whereby people that were coming and going and often brought by employers on the railroads were now locked in by a militarized border and the undocumented population has swelled. Uh, and most undocumented immigrants in the United States, <coughs> many of whom are also Asian American, not just Latino American, uh, many who are Irish in Boston too, a lot of races, most undocumented immigrants live with somebody who's not undocumented, somebody who's a citizen, somebody who's a legal permanent resident, their spouse or their child. And often these people are paying taxes, contributing to society, and race comes to them when they're not looking to try to divide themselves. They're trying to become part of our society. Uh, so that's another issue that we have to deal with here in Utah that affects uh, these populations. Just to conclude, to give enough time for, uh, to Dr. Hadfield, sociologist Elijah Anderson has uh, built on W.E.B. Du Bois, founding sociologist and founder of the NAACP, to develop the notion of the iconic ghetto. And that is this, that since the civil rights movement, the gates of the ghetto, in his words, to quote him, have opened. Most blacks in the United States are middle class. Most blacks today, actually, according to the census, live in suburbs. However, most blacks, in fact, he would argue all African Americans are judged by the iconic ghetto and constantly questioned and trying to be put in their place and assume that they all come from the same place. When they all have hopes and dreams and come from a variety of circumstances, and that affects all of us, whether consciously or subconsciously, and how we stereotype others. And like I said, this racial division has now moved into the Latino divide as well. And so these are things that we need to be made aware of and realize that racial segregation, even if it hasn't been a long-standing pattern in Provo, affects race relations everywhere. Thank you. little bit about the research that I have done personally and then draw some lessons that we can uh, maybe take from that. I study South African history as you maybe have read in the program and I'm sure all of you have heard about Nelson Mandela. He's probably the most famous African. Well in 1969, where I want to sort of start, Nelson Mandela and a number of his colleagues who had already been serving five years of their life imprisonment sentence uh, on Robben Island. Other leaders of organizations that were also fighting against uh, the apartheid, they were also in prison or like um, other leaders of Mandela's organization, the ANC, they had moved operations outside of South Africa. And black people in general were afraid of the reprisals of speaking out against an increasingly oppressive white supremacist government. But black university students in 1969 challenged this fear and the um, basis of apartheid by forming an exclusively black student organization. And this was the beginning of the black consciousness movement, which is what I study. In, um, this, in South Africa really changed the mindset a lot of, of a lot of people and um, transformed politics in South Africa in the 1970s. Now the students challenged the oppressive status quo by hitting at the assumptions that they saw that fund fundamentally sustained apartheid. They saw that there was this twin problem, they said, that there was the problem of white racism and then also black acquiescence to it. So black consciousness, this idea, was their antidote to this problem. It was the idea that black people in South Africa needed a psychological liberation, an awakening or, or a conscientization um, to their value and potential as black people, 
which would then, they believed, lead to a political liberation. Steve Biko, who is the most famous uh, uh, leader of this movement, wrote that the black man in South Africa had become a shell, completely defeated, an ox bearing the yoke of oppression with sheepish timidity. So their first step to remedying this was to make the black man come to himself, to pump, pump back life into his empty shell, to infuse him with pride and dignity. So the students really worked on this, and, and first of all was by promoting a positive black identity. They really uh, redefined what it meant to be black in South Africa, and they also focused on cr increasing black self-reliance. So an important part of this movement uh, was also its rejection of white liberal help. One of the slogans was, black man, you are on your own. That's what, what they um, used to define their movement. Black consciousness adherents believed white people, <laughs> however well-meaning they were, who were working against apartheid, they actually did not have the knowledge or commitment to articulate black grievance or act in support of black people's needs effectively. Instead, white liberalism was viewed as an obstacle to independent black initiative and organization because white leadership had the dam damaging effect of leading black people to believe that they must depend on white people for ideas. Black people working in partnership with the black community would themselves ensure organizations effectively address the real rather than the imagined needs of the black community. Now, activists argued that in saying this, they weren't anti-white, they were, in fact, pro-black, or as Dr. Mampella Rampele put it, they were just insisting on being ourselves. They envisioned a society where people, black people and white people could interact on a truly equal level if within themselves any notions of inferiority and superiority were no longer there. They were no longer held internally. Former activist Pandela Pandelani Nefalovodwe explained, for example, that black consciousness community work was used as part of making sure that black people's identity, black people's self-esteem, black people's trust on themselves should all come. And then you are able to release a person in society who can compete with others. So this was how black consciousness activists carried themselves. And for white people in South, South Africa, this was astonishing. Though in other settings, of course, it would be considered normal. Donald Woods, a white liberal newspaper editor who at first thought, oh, these people are racist, um, they're just, re it's reverse racism. He wrote about his first encounters with black consciousness activists. And he described these young black people as having an undeniable, full sense of self-worth, a poise and a confidence that few blacks in South Africa exhibited in their relationships with whites. They walked, talked, and slouched in chairs like everyone else. He could see that they were really comfortable with who they were. Conversation wasn't stilted or self-conscious. They walked tall in all things without deference or apology. Now, Donald Woods' relationship and friendship with black consciousness activists really had a big impact on his life and the life of his family. And you can see this history depicted in the film Cry Freedom. Uh, um, so may maybe some of you have seen this film about Donald Woods' relationship with Steve Biko. But you might be wondering, why uh, would this white liberal be friends with these activists? And you might also be wondering, why is this white woman from Logan, Utah, um, writing about this and talking about this movement? Um, well, my research um, in, in my book that's coming out focuses on the community development programs of the movement. But I was first attracted as a college student to the black consciousness movement because I saw the psychological aspect as vital, a vital foundation for building an equi equitable society. I dealt with my own struggles, uh, as small as they were, in coming to believe in myself for who I was and not trying to be someone else. And I had also been taught in my family to respect other people. And so I could see how important it was for black people in South Africa to cu cultivate a sense of human dignity as black people, and I could understand their desire to, to go it alone. Um, to, to reach that goal. But there is also a very profound lesson for white people in the black consciousness movement. It challenged stereotypes and demanded that white people see black people as equals, even partners and leaders. It demanded that white people not see black people as deficient, but creative, productive, and valuable in their own right. And this helped me in building my own relationships. And so what I want to do to finish up is just to draw out some, a few lessons um, from my study and my experiences to offer some suggestions in improving race relations. And the first one, I think, um, is that we need to recognize the human dignity of other people and treat people as equals. That, that's the first thing that we need to work on. Um, 
And part of that, in our relations with other people, to, to build that uh, recognition of human dignity is to understand um, or to promote positive images of people, to counter the negative images that come through the media, through all sorts of other ways that we receive these negative images. We really need to promote the positive images. And one of the important uh, lessons from the black consciousness movement um, that we can learn from it is the importance of a positive identity to building a positive future. So I've seen that um, in my own life, but also um, and, and in South Africa, and also uh, the power of self-confidence with the refugees from central, the Central African regions who live in Salt Lake and who I go to church with. Um, I've seen how powerful that self-confidence is within these refugees who have had to overcome huge ob obstacles. Those who believe in their abilities and potential take charge of their future. And they, and they use that um, to overcome these obstacles and, and build a great future for them and their, their children, themselves and their children. So what do we do when we have these stereotypes? Because they come, and I'm guilty of it. Um, if I see somebody, they're dressing a certain way, I start to make assumptions about who they are, and I'm ashamed to admit that, but we all do it. So what do you do when you have these stereotypes come into your mind? I had some great advice uh, from somebody before I went to South Africa the first time, and that was, okay, you have them, acknowledge that it's a stereotype and move on. And um, continue to focus on connecting with this person, seeing their humanity and their human dignity. I also think it's extremely important as we build relationships with people to ask questions and to listen. We have to have honest and respectful conversations and build relationships with people, and that means we need to be willing to speak and we need to be willing to listen. And that's one of the best ways um, to do that. Now, in this, we also need to be um, comfortable with our, ourselves, recognize our own self-worth and value. And I've been talking to some of my students and, and hearing these conversations um, in the public about white privilege, white guilt, what do we do with that? Um, I think you just recognize that and then you channel those energies into making those needed changes. And I want to finish by talking about something that I learned from Malcolm X. Um, I, I know in, in American society, we, a lot of us are afraid of Malcolm X, and there's some reasons for that, but we forget that he also changed and has some great lessons for all of us. And I encourage all of you to read his autobiography um, that Alex Haley put together. Um, in, in this book, he talks about the time when he, uh, he was with the Nation of Islam and in Harlem, and a young white college student came up to him and said, well, what can I do as a white person? What can I do? And he told her, you, nothing. He had preached that white, the white people were the devil. And he said, there's nothing you can do. But later, when he, um, af after he made the pil his pilgrimage to Mecca and changed his views on white people in America, he said that he regretted telling her that and wished that he could contact her and tell her, as he told other well-meaning white people, that they, quote, had to combat actively and directly the racism in other white people that where the really sincere white people have got to do their proving of themselves is not among the black victims, but out on the battle lines of where America's racism really is, and that is in their own home communities, end quote. And I think for him, and, and it, we all need to own this problem, it's all part of our society, and there's something that every one of us can do, even in small ways. So I'll just end with that, and I think we'll open up for questions now. Yes. positive images, you've seen a lot, it's a plea from the public with negative images. You've seen all these viral vi uh, videos that go out. What's your feeling about that versus how you can combat that in some way? We talked about this in the other group. Um, the, it is, uh, there's research done that images, I'll just stand so everybody can see me, um, that images have a more powerful effect of changing our stereotypes than even learning the history. Um, and so it's really important that we have those and we can use our own social media. Anytime you have something positive that comes out, share it. And, and we can also take an active part in uh, relating with the media, sharing stories with the media. Um, so uh, for example, I, I talked in the other group about the uh, story of black men in, um, I, I can't remember where it was, back east somewhere, who had gone out to cheer on the kids going to school to show that they were committed to education. And there was this image of these men in suit and ties, they were on their way to work, and they were committed to education. And I thought that was a very powerful image. I shared it on Facebook, I, 
these are the things that we need out in society. And uh, so we talked about how you can then also take an active part in the media to share these things. Um, one thing that the black consciousness movement did is uh, it, it's not just painting over the negative, right? You have to bring that out. And they really, the, the, the theater and poetry movement that went along with the black consciousness movement dealt with that, what does it mean to be oppressed? What, is it, what does that mean? So that was part of it. But then they also produce their own media. In fact, one of the uh, programs that I focused my research on is uh, what they called Black Review. It was a yearbook of black activity. They talked about the negative things, but they also focused on the positive things. This is what's happening in the black community, and that was to make a deliberate positive message to people in the community. So um, one of the officers said that she's been working with the media, the local newspapers, to do that, and I think that's something we can all be involved in. One uh, piece of research that we're working on right now that's under review and it is, looks like it's going to be published is on the experience of military veterans. We know that the United States military is one of the very few racially integrated institutions and that they had to make a deliberate decision not only to change attitudes but to institute laws, policies, and practices in the 1970s to make that a reality. And that is bearing fruit. The military veterans who go out into the open market and can choose whatever neighborhood they want to live in and they live in the same metropolitan areas as the other people that aren't the civilians, they choose more racially integrated neighborhoods. And it's not just because they're more likely to have a spouse of a different race or ethnicity, it's above and beyond that. And we think, and it's, and it's real, they're about two or three decades ahead of the rest of the country and the pace of racial integration among veterans. We think that's because of that experience that they have and that it's meaningful, it's not superficial. So what if our image of military veterans, you know, went beyond the kind of, you know, do it before the ball game kind of thing, scarf down the hot dog kind of thing, July 4th, Veterans Day, included this is a way we can form a more just and inclusive society on the basis of race and that people understood that this has a whole architecture behind it, right? That we have to have a deliberate, you know, kind of movement to make that a reality. And you see it with your friendship among the two of you, right? It's, it's a testament to that right there. Uh, and, and we see it in the data, it's over 13 million uh, people getting home loans over the last few years that we studied. So, so that's, that's the positive thing that I forgot, but I, I snuck it in there in the Q&A, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, piggybacking on that, having been raised in the military, I think the benefit flows not just to those who were in the military, but to the family and the to children. The children. Absolutely. Yeah, we need to make that big image. And speaking of images, I'll just say this really quickly. So my high school on the south side, uh, Commons from our neighborhood, Nazima Hamu who's on the Chicago Bulls, Dorian Warren who's on MSNBC. But beyond that, people in the symphony, a police officer who took a bullet. We need to expand the images too that certain racial groups have of themselves, like the, I can only be a musician or I can only be this. Uh, we know the Asian Americans feel a lot of pressure that they have to be in the professional fields because their immigrant parents want to protect them from racism and discrimination. And they're starting to say, we can become artists, we can become this, we can become whatever we want, right? And that's really the American dream, that nobody's held back because of their race. Isn't and so we have to promote those positive images. Isn't it something, too, that those who can text your child from racism, you promote them to be... That's why they're doing it. Kids, yeah, yeah. Right? And so, yeah. how about we just stop being racist? You know, because it can be. Exactly. They want to be. You don't have to protect your child from racism by saying, behave in this kind of respectful manner. That's right. I'm glad you brought that up, because it's a two-way street. It can't just be... Asian Americans formed their coalition. They did these new narratives like Constance Wu and, and so forth. Uh, it has to be white people need to stop discriminating mm -hmm. as well. It has to be a yeah, two-way street. Actually, if, if Sorry, go ahead. You were going to make that comment a little bit louder. I was saying what she said. When you say we're going to do this or we're trying to be professors or whatever to cover or protect our kids, we're not finishing the roof. We're not taking the race away. We're just kind of covering up. Right. Being what other white people can be, so we can cover up and be the same, but we're not finishing it. So we need to finish it from the bottom. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm just reporting back the research. Jennifer Lee at UC Riverside is is the woman when it comes to this. I mean, she is all in, and this is what everybody's talking about now—the fastest growing minority group. And people think, oh, it's just because you know, just like the thing with athletics and blacks, they have some sort of super gene. But Chinese immigrants in Spain are at the bottom of the ladder. Korean immigrants in Japan, bottom of the ladder. Nobody there is saying that it's because of race, right? We know that there's social processes, and one of the big ones is discrimination. And so those Asian immigrant parents 
they're trying to protect their kids by saying, go into law, medicine, and engineering, because that's like by the books, right? You get the numbers and you're in. If you go on TV or sports, right, we saw what happened with Jeremy Lin. Everybody talked about him in a cer certain way, way a certain stereotype. So I, I agree completely. Thank you. I, I feel that in order to stop racism, it's really simply to not get offended. That's as simple as it can get. And um, I know that people's personalities are different. Some are just, just normally just, they just don't take offense. They're more chill, they're relaxed. And others are more strong. Um, there's a lot more stronger personality. And I feel that not taking offense it can be learned for those who aren't naturally um, prone to that and that it can be taught. And if th that is the, probably the most easiest solution. I'll just say real quickly, I have a lot of black students at BYU and, and, and a lot of them, uh, almost all of them are from suburban areas and they've grown up with integrated friendships. And a lot of them, the problem of race, they, they encounter it here for the very first time. And for them, that, that solution doesn't work for them as the solution to the problem because they've never taken offense before uh, and, and they have to bear the burden that white people don't have to bear of speaking out on behalf of their race and so forth. So I think that um, certainly we ha all have our own agency, but I found in my experience based on the students and their experiences that that, that falls short for them and their experience. Well, actually, I think, yeah, can you elaborate a little bit more because I think you, I knew where you were going with it about the person. Right. Um, well, how about you elaborate and and taking the spin off on, on taking offense? Because obviously, we we naturally don't want to get take offense if someone is, is directing something at us because it may be just they might just have stuck their foot in their mouth or or they might have um, <coughs> just didn't know um, how how to approach that. Just like recently, I had a a coworker that was new and they asked me a, a innocent question that I knew where they were coming from that I did not take offense, and normally I don't take offense, but other people might have taken offense, as in the question was, you have slanted eyes, can you really see through them? And because I knew where he was coming from, it was such an innocent question, and that I just naturally asked, yeah, because that's all I know. You know, that's how I see, and that's all I know of it. And so the whole idea is, it's to not take offense. It's so easy if we don't carry that, that animosity and, and to just let it go. So this if I could fill in on that, actually, that if I can, go? just to, I think that maybe what I hear you saying, what I was interpreting is you use that opportunity not to take offense, but to educate the people that are talking to you. So that it's not, and you just described it when you were talking to them. I think it all depends on the relationship you have with, with them. For, and it depends what your position is. For example, I, I was doing a project in Romania, Romanian National Police, and I had a, a bunch of American police representatives, and a colonel and a Romanian police said, they were talking about the, uh, the gypsies over there, the Romas, and he said, we were saying, how come you don't integrate them? How come you don't have any Roma police officers? And he actually said to our panel, oh, they're the same way the blacks are in America. And at first it just took the wind out of me and I was like, did he really just say that? How could it be misinterpreted? And he went on to something else and I had to stop and go back and go, listen, that is a false statement. You, I don't know what you've been seeing on TV, what type of negative images, but that's not uh, the, the way we interact with our community. Okay, so first we have to understand what racism is. That's the, like, we have to get back to basics. What is racism? It is a system of oppression, okay? Critical race theory, if you have not say critical race theory, that's the first, that's homework. It's a system of oppression. So what, the way that we are either, we either benefit from that system or we are oppressed by that system. Racism makes up privilege and power. So therefore, as an individual, I cannot, um, do anything if I, in a system to break down a system of power if I don't have privilege of power in that system and if I'm oppressed by it. So to, to, not, be, to not be offended by something, that's, that, does not do, that doesn't do anything to deconstruct this system that I am oppressed by. Now what that can do 
And I would stop, LaShawn taught me this, is to be tough on systems of oppression and tough on institutions and tender with people. And so what I can do is I can be tender one-on-one. -on -one. I can work to build a relationship. That's the power that I have is in that micro interaction, in our individual relationship. However, that is not the same as, as saying this is a system that oppresses people of color, or this is a system that oppresses women, or this is a system that oppresses whoever. And for, we, can, we can't keep tiptoeing around what the real definition of racism is. It's a system of oppression. We can't just say, well, it's about what you, this comment or that comment. It's much bigger than that. It's much bigger. So that, again, tough on institutions of oppression, tough on systems, tender with people, I think, is the way that we're going to move forward. It's got to be top down and bottom up. Mm -hmm. Amen. I just got to comment. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of Jane Elliott. Um, she was like a fifth grade teacher, white, in Iowa, and she did this experiment with her class, which was uh, brown eyed, blue eyes. And I had the opportunity of being in one of her classes in uh, roughly around 1986 or so. It was like a three day session. And that's uh, what she had talked about was being oppressed. And so when she had the collars, they wore, uh, you know, green collars depending on your eye color, uh, and then browns for the brown eyes or the minorities always wore the brown. And so in that experiment, she would go and show that, um, you know, people don't say, oh, I don't see color, you know, because she made an illustration of, you know, a black person and a white person, and then she said, now, do you see this person here? He's black. And so do, don't say that, you know, I don't see color. You, you notice that he's black. And so I think once we need to break down some of those barriers and then say that, um, yeah, I understand, or maybe I don't understand, but can you teach me? Uh, and and, and kind of go with that. But you do have to, you know, talk about it. And so this is a great forum today. And I, would, I just thought about Jane Elliott. Yeah, no, that's great. And I would encourage those who have white friends who don't get it, to watch the MTV White People documentary. It's only 45 minutes. All the swearing is bleeped out. <laughs> I know we're in Happy Valley. And, uh, and it, it, it really gets to the core of, like, we can't pretend to be colorblind, and we need to talk about race. And we don't have to feel guilty either. Uh, white identity doesn't have to be at one extreme, you're the KKK, or at the other extreme, mm -hmm. you have no culture, no identity. It could be a middle ground of, I can be a co-participant, a fellow American, who can work for positive change, like we see these two gentlemen here. Mm -hmm. Tema. Oh, I was just going to say also, with the, the, the notion of not being offended, um, I, I guess that, that generally kind of rubs me the wrong way. It's offensive. Just kidding. But it is. <laughs> but it, it, the thought of, of you can say whatever you want to to me, and my feelings are not supposed to get hurt. We're not robots. Like, there's going to be emotion attached to it. And so it's... For me, it's okay for me to be in my feel away about some things as long as I'm willing to work through it and to talk and to, to have that person talk me through it. Why would you? Why did you say? Why did you ask me if I could see because of my eyes? Like, what would give you that idea? Because there's some other things that are attached, and I think that some things are sometimes people are trying to offend you. If I'm a, a um, Latino, a, a Latin American. And, and I keep getting pulled over, and I keep getting asked for my citizenship papers, that is going to start to rub me the wrong way. And then I'm going to start to have some feelings about police officers when I see them, because I see that they don't see me the same way that they see other people. And so if, if, he, if he's not going around asking other people, if his eyes are blue and he's not asking brown-eyed people, can, do you see brown out of your eyes? then to me, it, it becomes intentional. And that's something that he could actually look up on the internet. And so I think that to, to tell people that they cannot be offended is, it's not only, it, it feels arrogant, but it also, it also feels like you don't care. You don't want to deal with me. You don't want to walk with me in my issue. So we all have to be the same. And to be the same, I have to conform. And I cannot be 
I mean, if I'm if I'm gonna conform, I want to be at the highest level. So I can't be a white man. And because I can't be a white man, you have to deal with me and this issue that I'm having because of something that has happened to me. So if you want me to conform, you have to learn how to see the world through my lens. And I think that the, the idea of people wanting to be offended, I just think that that is, it just seems inhumane for, to me. And it, it just does, it's not a good feeling because it means that you don't, you don't see me. Well, Sean, I made mine. Well, he had his hand up first before okay. me, so I'll go after. Oh, I'm probably just going to be offensive. But. Go for it. You're a good table. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the this is the offensive table. Yeah. I was thinking back to what Hudson said in his, his opening comments about how the issues of racism seem to be breaking down in our society, getting more racist, more division, and, and all those sorts of things things more recently than, than we were several years ago, and trying to marry Ashley's comments with your comments. And, and reflecting back on the discussion we had in the prior hour about the elephant in the room, and, and being a white person who has many friends of color. Um, I'm glad you didn't say one, or you just your best friend, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my best friend's what? Oh, yours too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Many friends of mine. I appreciate that. Just... I do, and, 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 and they're like lots of different colors. They're not, you know. You see color. And, and my color changes in the summertime. Imagine, Imagine that. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you I have lots of chemicals. But, <laughs> but anyway, what I was going to say is, is I think Ashley makes a good point when we marry it with these comments that sometimes, from the white perspective, the challenge of talking about race with people who have a different race or a different religion or a different any kind of differences is that some people seem to be so sensitive that when you kind of begin to broach the subject, it turns into a thermonuclear meltdown. And other people like Ashley mentioned, well, it's not a big deal. I assume he wasn't intentional. I'm just going to respond to that. And I think that if we were to treat the individuals with kindness and try not to be so sensitive, like the media hypersensitizes everything. If we were to just dial that down and on the personal image say, I assume unless you're more obnoxious than I am, you really didn't intend to offend me. I'm going to try and work with that. And so I want to help you understand where I'm coming from, and I'll try and understand where you're coming from. So I don't expect everybody to see the world through Tamu's eyes, and I don't expect her to see the world through my eyes. But maybe if we can get some way in the middle of the table, we'll get a dialogue that makes sense. And the racial tensions or the ethnic differences or the religious differences, if Linda were still sitting here, would dial down. And we'll start to see people as people who have different lifestyle experiences, which enrich the overall community. So. Preach, yes. I agree, and I, I, I kind of want to jump on that because um, it's about making what you said. I'm going to assume that you didn't mean to be a jerk when you said X, Y, Z, and I'm going to talk to you. Like Making that part explicit, I think, can help in conversations. I got bullied all the time for how I looked when I was little because I have big eyes. And so when someone makes a comment about eyes, like that's a sensitive thing for me because I got bullied for that. So if another employee, someone that's my equal, comes to me and says, can you see extra because your eyes are so big? I'm going to be like, <laughs> like I'm going to have a response to that. You know what I mean? And I get what you mean to like not be offended by what they're saying. I get that. And still, like for me, I'm like, oh, I'm almost, I almost lost respect for you in that moment. How come you would ask me that? There's a conversation that I still feel like I gotta have, and no, I'm not offended, but I remember those kinds of Absolutely. things, you know. And that's my work environment. And you're my colleague, and I gotta go. Like we have to do this thing together. And if you are worried about my physical appearance, you trusted me to say that to me. How are you responding when you're out and you're not around me? Like what happens then? And then how does my relationship to you and the respect that we have with each other? How does it influence the way you interact with other people when I'm not around? Like, I just, I have so many questions after something like that happens. And, oh my gosh, like, that, that's just, that's, 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 I don't know where you work. I don't know who you work around. Um, Please don't tell him. <laughs> but that, yeah, that just. I, I think overall, it's just the, the bottom line when I said to not take offense yeah. is it's a choice of whether or not you're going to take offense. Okay. That is the the overall is you have a choice whether or not you're going to uh, be offended or not.
I think it is a choice not to get offended sometimes, but it depends the situation if they're gonna humiliate you. Because it happened to me once I walked into the emergency room with my child who needed to be taken care of, but the person looked at me and looked at me Spanish and assumed the most Spanish people don't speak English and need a translator. So instead of taking care of my child, he, he just went like this and went back into the office and I needed to get my child in the room. And then she came back and she just kept going like this and I said, I need my child to be seen. And she said, translator, translator, translator. And I really got offended. And I said, not because every Spanish out there needs a translator doesn't mean I can't speak for myself. So I couldn't just say, oh, I'm not gonna get offended because she assumed I don't speak English, but she did humiliate me and my child was in danger. His life was in danger. So I think it goes back to she was looking at it racist and saying, oh, all Spanish that come need, tr need help, don't have insurance, don't have papers, don't speak English. And so they picture you as all Spanish that don't have it. Mm -hmm. When I, I wasn't born here, but I was raised here, I, I feel I speak enough English, and I'm a citizen, and I have school. So then it did offend me, because she didn't stop to see my child, and first was more uh, interested in finding a translator. So I wouldn't say I couldn't get offended, because I knew she was looking at me uh, Spanish with no insurance, with no English, mm -hmm. instead of looking at the emergency my child needed. And you almost have to look at that person saying, because she is ignorant, I'm not taking offense. It's a choice. Is that what you did with your coworker? Oh, I, I knew where he was coming from, and he himself was ethnic. And so I didn't take offense. It's, it's, not, a, it's not because I don't care. Mm -hmm. It's the whole idea is I made a choice to not carry that offense. And if I, but then before that, let me go, if I could add, first of all, this is part of the good example of where we need to keep the discussion safe, a safe environment. So Ashley's expressed her opinion, we will respect that opinion if we go to Leslie. Well, and one thing that I was going to say, I think I'm hearing from people, is that we don't want to shut these conversations down because we need to have them. We need to have, we need to talk to people and say, look, okay, I'll, I'll, before I even answer your question, I'm going to tell you what that makes me feel um, when you say something like that. And I really like this, be tough on those, be hard on the systems and then tender with people as much that's as you can, point. but not let these things go. And I think that's sort of bringing what I hear um, everyone saying is we can't shut those conversations down, but we need, um, we need to have them in a, a productive way. Glory. Yeah, because I think when you take the safe and uh, the safety classes, they say you don't lose. How does it go? The phrase, you can lose your life in one minute. But I can't remember right now what I was going to say about the phrase. But it says um, it's about. When, for example, my child was in danger. So if they take one more minute to try to find a translator, um, let's pretend he's going to lose his life. Because sometimes life is that fast, goes that fast. So what I'm saying is, I didn't, if I stop to not take it offensive, it's good because it's gonna help me as a person. But at the same time, you have to stop that and break it down to those people, those employees, those secretaries, those receptionists, to where instead of them thinking, okay, she's Spanish, you know, they bring all these ideas, let's stop, let's look at the moment, let's see what's happening right now, and maybe instead of thinking Spanish, don't speak English, don't have insurance, instead of thinking all of those things, Maybe they look at the emergency instead of the other picture. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it is important not to take it offen offensive and to not make it hurt you, but at the same time to stop those things from happening so that people get the help they need right. in any situation, work or hospital. Right, and just think about, I mean, from what I said earlier, if they would have, okay, there's a stereotype, but I'm going to ask a question. Right. Then it could, that whole situation could have been avoided. And yet on one end, as a nurse, um, legally they have to get you an interpreter. They have to if you need help. So you have to yeah. ask or yeah. just assume? They, they yeah. have to get you an interpreter. So now the racial profile in the so, so if I come in and, and you speak go. a different language now? Well, no, 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 but she, 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 speaks she speaks English. But, but still, you don't so if, know. So you just look at people. A whole other perspective. No, no, no. I'm just saying, writer. she said that she walked in. Speaking English. And she speaking, she, she didn't say anything, and the lady told her not to say anything. 
So as soon as I walk in, you're going to give me an urban translator. Um, it becomes a real legal issue. I'm just saying there's another perspective on that. A whole other perspective but without on speaking. the event is that through the hospital, we have, we have to cover so many different languages. Gotcha. If I could stop it here and again, and we can go, oh, no, snap, There's an elephant in the back. Okay. Uh, thank our panelists for doing it. We've been special. Thank you.